All right. This is one of my favorite lectures. Um, I like this one. Uh, it's going to come with a story. Uh, it's certainly going to be related to consciousness and one of the senses of consciousness um, as, as we talk about it. Remember, consciousness has many different sort of meanings. So we're going to be focusing on one of them. And specifically, we're going to be focusing on this concept of self-awareness. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about like, how do you know if somebody is self-aware and by somebody, I don't just mean a human being. I mean, how would we know if animals possess self-awareness? Uh, you guys know now a little bit about my unique position, I guess, on, on animal research. Um, I don't feel that we're justified to, to do things to animals that would be considered unethical if done to humans, as you, as you're aware. Um, but when you think about, you know, those who do think this is okay, Okay, that is justified. What are the reasons that they that they mention? And one of the reasons, one of the things they sometimes talk about is, is humans having something animals don't have. Some sort of, in a philosophical term, they might call it agency. Um, the sense of themselves as a being that's going through life and sort of making decisions. You know, a self-awareness, a sense of self. And so, you know, many people had argued for many years, and, and Descartes would certainly be on, on this uh, bandwagon, I think, that humans might be uniquely self-aware. We might be the only species that has a real sense of ourselves as, a, as an individual entity in the world um, and, and a sense of who that individual is, okay? Um, is that true? How do you know? Can you use science? Um, to do this, okay? Well, turns out you kind of can. So this is going to be another cool scientific journey where we're going to talk about research, what it means, what it might not mean. And again, we're going to start here with all these definitions I told you about, but we're really going to zoom in on this. <clears throat> so again, consciousness, the, that term means different things to different people. I don't want to use the word consciousness. You know I've used conscious mind and unconscious mind. I like to use them as adjectives, not as a noun. Um, but um, I do agree with this notion of self-awareness. And it's a little distinct, right? It's very different from how I've at least been talking to you about the conscious mind so far. I've been talking to the conscious mind about goal states and you know the current situation and how you can use strategies to get where you want to go. Um, but we also, as we do those things, as we go through life, as we make decisions and things happen to us, we certainly develop a sense of ourselves, you know, who we think we are, what we think we're about in life. And of course, a lot of our strategies will connect with this. So this is where, you know, things get complex. It is our conscious mind, I believe, that thinks about ourself and who we are, and who we want others to see ourselves as, etc. Um, who we are now, who we want to become. Uh, and so that's, you know, every now and then the conscious mind focuses on the individual who's in possession of that mind. Um, and so we would call that self-awareness, the idea that, you know, this conscious mind is aware that it lives within an individual body, uh, an individual human being, and it starts to develop some sort of representation of that being. Uh, so we call that self-awareness. I would say self-awareness is a product of the conscious mind. Um, I don't think it's synonymous with the conscious mind. It's something the conscious mind does. It creates a sense of who we are and what we're about. Okay, so I just want to try to connect some of these as we go through. But for now, we're really going to focus on that issue then, self-awareness. Um, I'm going to bring it up in the context of mirrors because you're going to see mirrors are a critical part of all of this. And, you know, you saw a video at the very beginning in the top hat about animals reacting to mirrors. And, of course, mirrors confuse animals when they first interact with them big time. Um, they tend to not see, there are no mirrors in the wilderness. And so when they see a reflected image, they don't have a concept of a mirror. So they think those things in the mirror are real um, and they react to them as though they're real. And you've seen some of that in that video. If you haven't, go back to... I believe that was chapter two, uh, very early on in the beginning, and watch that video about animals reacting to mirrors. Um, you know, mirrors for us are really important, right? How many mirrors do you have in your home? How many times do you look in the mirror a day? 
When we look in the mirror, we are very dramatically looking at ourselves, right? We're seeing a reflection of ourselves in the mirror. And, and that's a very powerful thing. You know, we use it to do things like inspect our bodies. And sometimes we're happy with what we see. Sometimes we're not happy with what we see. And, and that can feed into our sense of self. You know, oh, I'm not a disciplined person because I don't have the muscles I should have if I were a much more disciplined person, etc. Uh, and so, you know, that can actually feed into, you know, why don't I do these things? And why am I not the kind of person who, who maybe you know, wood, etc. So mirrors are reflective devices. They have us sort of think about ourselves and we put them everywhere, not everywhere, but you know, they're around and we consult them regularly. Um, so kind of interesting when you, when you think of it, that they're a tool that really enables self-reflection. And, and I don't just mean that as a reflected image. I mean, as in the deeper kind of sense. So you're going to see mirrors are going to play a role in these experiments that we're talking about as well to get at self-awareness. Okay, so just before I get into the actual experiments, I want to um, talk about critical thought again, and, and I want to kind of reconnect a little bit with chapter two and the scientific method. And, you know, my claim there is that you should trust research, published research in peer-reviewed journals way more than you should trust somebody's opinion on a blog or somebody who claims they're an expert and, and spouts off about whatever. You should be saying, where's the published data to support that? Uh, because that's critical thought. And as a scientist, when you're training to be a scientist, when you go to graduate school, um, there is a lot of critical thinking exercise. Science is really built around critical thought. And there's, there's a couple of parts of this. We've talked about this part before. You know, every article before it's published is examined by at least three other professors who are also doing research in that field. And they're tear it apart. You know, they are trying to find every weakness, either in the execution of the experiment or the, the um, conclusions that you draw from that experiment. They read your paper very carefully and they say, do I believe that? Do I accept that? Did they do that experiment right? The way they define their variables, does that make sense? Um, the, the, the conclusions they drew, did, first of all, did they even do the right statistical analysis? That's always part of it. Did they analyze their data right? If they did, did they then draw appropriate conclusions from their analysis? Uh, and so you have three people, you know, looking really hard at your work and ultimately writing detailed critical, um, constructive feedback, kind of like peer scholar, but very detailed, you know, often a page or two from each reviewer, uh, where they ultimately decide, should this be published or not? And they also, if they think, well, maybe it should be, there's almost always a list of things that need to be fixed, changed. And sometimes that means you have to run another experiment to rule out this possibility that you didn't even talk about, but it's possible. So, run this other experiment, you know, and make sure that that's true. So I just want you to have that sense. This is what science stews in. And so when you're starting to design a paper, starting to design a research uh, experiment, you know, you want to publish that and you know what's waiting at the end. It's those three reviewers. So you had better be your own toughest reviewer. You had better think of everything as you go through every decision you make about how to do things. Is this the best decision? Is there a better way to do this? Um, and that's a lot of, again, what the training is in graduate school. So a whole lot of critical thought that goes into stuff. There's another way that critical thought is continually exercised in graduate school. And it's going to be related to the story I, I, I tell you. And it's what I'm going to call academic sparring during talks. Um, science is a contact sport. It's not a contact sport. Okay. No, well, it shouldn't be a contact sport. Typically scientists are not physically roughhousing each other in any sort of way, but intellectually they certainly are. And academically they certainly are at the level of critical thought. Um, what we often do, uh, is we invite speakers to come to our department and talk about their research. 
And of course, one of the things we want to do is, is, is listen to them and, and learn from their research. But we always often see that as training opportunities for our students as well. And what we want our students to do is do exactly like the reviewers do over here. Try to find problems or issues with the research and take that person on. Spar with them and say, well, why would you do it that way? Shouldn't it, wouldn't, you, wouldn't it make more sense to do the experiment this other way? Or you're concluding X, but you haven't ruled out Y, have you? And that's how the students kind of impress the, the supervisors, by showing they can think really deeply and, and find sort of unearth issues or problems. Uh, and we're rewarded if we can do that. If we can find a real flaw in somebody's logic, um, we're rewarded. Like, excellent. You made a great point there. That was really good. Okay. With this as context, and 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 you know what, and the point I want to make, you you'll hear every now and then where people are saying today, well, I'm my own expert. I don't need any experts. I can do my own research. Th those people haven't gone through this critical thought training, um, and so they're much more willing to accept things easily. Whereas once you've gone through this critical thought training. You're very skeptical about stuff, and, and you know how to look at it very closely and find the flaws. Uh, and that's why if something is published, from comes out of the scientific community and passes all those hurdles, you can trust it so much more. Okay. Made that point before, but I think it's just an important point that, that um, in the world we live in, that, that you all understand. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a story, and we'll get back to self-awareness then. The academic sparring. So I was at University of Waterloo. University of Waterloo, that's where I did my graduate uh, training. University of Waterloo loved critical thought, and they trained us really strongly to learn how to rip apart other people's scientific experiments. It sounds nasty, but that's what they thought made science progress finding the flaws and stuff and fixing them and making it better. And so they thought this, this was a critical role. And we would always have speakers come in, and the speakers were tests. They were tests for all the students. Um, the, the faculty would kind of sit back and say, let's see if students can find problems with this and, and whether they're willing to challenge a researcher, an established researcher, uh, and take them on because those are the qualities you need to be a good scientist. And so we all knew it was a test, and we would be there trying our best to find flaws and stuff. Okay, with this as context, we were told that we were going to have a speaker come in named Gordon Gallup. He was out of New York, and he was going to tell us about research demonstrating self-awareness in animals. We all had the widest grin because <laughs> we thought, you can't do good science on self-awareness. Self-awareness is this fluffy kind of thing. Like, how can you ever know if, if a human is self-aware, let alone if an animal is self-aware who can't even speak or do anything? Uh, and so we were licking our chops, as they say. This guy was going to come in, and we were just going to tear him apart. We, this was going to be easy. This was going to be fun. It wasn't so easy. It was really interesting. It changed my life, <laughs> in part, I have to say. This is one of the things that really kind of messed with my mind and made me think a little differently um, about the distinction between humans and animals. So let me walk you through it. Here's the story. The story begins, I'm not sure this is all completely true, but it makes for a good story. So the, the important parts are true, the story part. I don't know. But the story goes like this, that Gordon had a, a graduate student in his lab. His graduate student had to do a PhD. And one of the tricky things, of course, is to figure out what your topic is. Now, Gordon Gallup uh, worked in an animal lab. So there, were, there was a lab with all sorts of different animals in it. Um, that different people were doing research with for various ways. And the, the notion was that this graduate student was trying to figure out, okay, what will my research be? And theoretically, they were shaving in the mirror one day, thinking about this question, and they came to that realization that I started this all with, that mirrors are weird. Mirrors don't really occur in nature. There's flat water. So every now and then an animal might see its reflection in flat water, um, but for the most part, an animal would never see its reflection. And so he thought, what would animals do if I put mirrors in the cages in the lab? Now, you've seen that video that I mentioned earlier. That shows what animals do when they first see a mirror. 
but he wanted to kind of look at it more more longitudinally. What a horrible word. What if that mirror was in the lab for a while? How would the animal come to respond to it? And what he found is, so, so, so he went around and he hung mirrors in a bunch of animal labs, okay? And he, what he found just sort of colloquially before this was sort of a structured research project, he just noticed what happened. And, and he noticed that for most animals, the first step was the step you see in that, that other video. They seemed to think the reflection was a reflection of another animal like them, and they responded to it however they would respond to another one of them. So if I was a parakeet and you put a mirror there, I would look at it and however I would normally respond to a new parakeet being introduced, that's how I responded to my reflection. For some animals, that's aggressive. And, and you see that with some of the gorillas, especially the silverbacks and, and that other thing where they're trying to attack the other silverback. Of course, it drives them crazy because every time they attack, that guy attacks. And every time they back off, that guy backs off. And so they're like confused as heck. It's the hardest fight they've ever fought because... Yeah, it's, it's just really hard to make anything happen. Um, but other animals, like by the way, um, there's a video of a killer whale where we bring a big mirror into their underwater space. And when the killer whale sees their reaction, they go away and then they come back with a fish. They get a fish and they bring the fish to this new killer whale. That's pretty cool, huh? It's kind of like when you move into a, into a neighborhood and one of your new neighbors brings some potluck dish for you. Very civilized, right? So the point being, however an animal would normally greet a stranger, a newcomer of his species, that's what they do in step one. Okay. Every animal does that. Then we get to step two. Um, step two, the, the, the classic example of this is dogs. Um, dogs don't reach step three, which, which broke my heart when I first heard it. <laughs> but, but dogs will reliably reach step two. And if you have a dog, you probably know this, especially if you have like a room in your house that has ceiling to wall mirrors where the dog could see its reflection. What happens? You know, at first, when a dog sees its reflection, yes, it will bark at it, it will do whatever. But if that reflection is there every day, what happens is the dog starts to just ignore it. It's like it doesn't exist. It can be hard to get the dog to look at its reflection. The dog has kind of learned, okay, there's something over there. Maybe it looks like a dog, but remember to dogs, vision is just one of, uh, and, and a lesser sense. Um, what they really care about is smell. And that thing smells like nothing. It smells like a mirror, <laughs> whatever a mirror smells like. It doesn't smell like another dog. Um, so it might have a, a visual um, look of a dog, and that's what you know gets the dog reactive at first. But after a while, it's like, okay, so what? It looks like a dog. It doesn't smell like a dog, and it doesn't do anything. It doesn't bring any good into my world. It doesn't bring any bad into my world. Uh, and so it begins to, what we're going to call habituate, it starts to just think that's that thing there that's irrelevant. And it starts to see it as irrelevant and it just ignores it, okay? So a lot of animals reach that stage. They, they first react to the thing like it's another member of their own species, but then after a while, they start to just ignore it. And for many animals, that's where it ends, okay? But there's a few animals that were taking another step. They were looking in the mirror and they were starting to use the mirror as a tool. As a tool to self-inspect, okay? They would open their mouths. So the classic ones were chimps, by the way. The first ones we knew uh, that, that could pass the mirror test, as we'll say, were chimps. So they would look at their mouth. Uh, they would look at their butt and their body over their shoulder like you've never done it. Um, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. They would, they would be inspecting parts of their body they could not normally see. They were curious. Um, and they saw the mirror as a tool to, well, it looked like self-inspect. And if, if it looks like they're self-inspecting, doesn't that give you a sense of, of them having a self or feeling like they have a self, a self-awareness? Okay, this part of the research, and this is how research sometimes happens, this was more of the sort of observational research, not really classic observational research, but it was kind of like, let's hang some mirrors and let's see what happens, and let's take notes. And then they noted these three stages. It's like, okay, very interesting. 
they were especially interested in the chimps and what the chimps were doing. And so what they came with then was a much more formal approach um, to using mirrors to try to assess the presence of self-awareness. And what they came up with is something, oh, sorry, I've given you these, these stages. I should have just laid these out uh, while I was doing it. So yeah, these were the stages they saw in the first step. Okay, I'll just give you a second to look at those and I'll have a drink of water. <laughs> but this is everything I was just talking about. Okay, so now how did they formalize it? Well, this is the formalization. So it's now known as the mirror test um, or, or rouge test. Let me just, let me just be, um, <laughs> more right about that. Uh, the mirror test or the rouge test of self-awareness why mirror, why rouge? Well, you'll see both are involved um, as, as we go through. Um, so it's just what people refer to it as. Often when it's done with humans, we call it the rouge test. When it's with animals, we call it the mirror test. Same test. Okay, so here's how it works. So first of all, you begin kind of like we just described. You hang a mirror in an animal's room and you leave it there for a while. And you let them reach whatever stage they may reach. So in the chimpanzee case, they might be starting to look at themselves, self-inspect, etc. Cool. Now, whenever there's an animal lab, there are times when animals have to be anesthetized. And, you know, the classic one is when they need dental work, for example. You don't want to do dental work on an awake chimpanzee. Um, chimpanzee can rip your arms off if it wants to, so you don't want to mess with it. Uh, and so they would anesthetize the chimpanzee. Um, and while they're doing the dental stuff, they would do the dental stuff they have to do. But at the same time, they would now mark the chimpanzee's face and they would put two marks on it one on a brow ridge one on an earlobe okay um, the other brow ridge and the other earlobe were left just as they are right but we put a red mark rouge red mark on one eyebrow ridge and one ear now notice these are things that the, the chimp can't see without a mirror right? You just, you know, try, <laughs> try to look at your own brow ridge, try to look at your own earlobe. You can't do it. Um, so, and, and we also made sure, by the way, they also made sure that these were odorless and tactile substances. They don't feel like anything when they're there and they don't smell like anything. And so without a mirror, the animal should have no idea this was done to them, that they have these marks on their face. Okay. We cover the mirror for a while and we let the animal recover from surgery. So we give them their normal recovery time that they need to be back awake, alert, feeling normal, right? So it might be a day or two, um, something like that. Then we uncover the mirror, show them their reflections and ask, well, in this case, measure what they do. And specifically, you know, as you're starting to think about experiments now, you know, what, what do we have? We have experimental conditions and control conditions. What's the experimental and what's the control condition in this, in this um, you know, what, what is the independent variable? The independent variable is whether a part of the face was marked or not. And so we have two parts that are marked. Those are the experimental markings, as I think will become clear in just a moment. And then there are two places that are not marked. These are the control markings okay because what we then do is we expose them to the mirror and we just watch them but specifically we measure how often do they touch the areas that are marked when they're looking in the mirror and how often do they touch the other areas so the experimental areas and the control areas by the way for half of the chimps this would be the experimental and this would be control for the other half this would be experimental and this would be control that's just counterbalancing to make sure left, right doesn't matter. You're learning science, so, so let's talk about these things as we go. What he found um, is that they touched the red areas a lot more than the control areas, right? So the control areas just tell you, well, how often do they happen to touch that part of their face anyway? And we get a sense, okay, yeah, they touch that part of their face now and then. But these parts of the face, they touched a lot. They were looking in the mirror going, what the and you know well at least to gordon and his student the claim was they're essentially saying what the heck is on my face the critical word there is my my face 
what is on my face. In order to care, to have a you know, sense there is something on my face, um, you have to have a sense of me, self. You know, that belongs to me. That face belongs to me, which means you have to have a sense of self. So Gallup's original research suggested that chimpanzees, at least, have a sense of themselves. Um, okay, that's where it all started. So, so just kind of getting back to, to my story a little bit. Gordon Gallup comes in, he shows us all the data on this, he describes this, this method, the professors are all there waiting for us to just rip him to shreds, and we're sitting there going, this is pretty compelling. <laughs> and and, he, and Gallup was kind of challenging us. If it's not self-awareness, what, how do you explain them touching these parts? Again, they can't smell them, they can't feel them, they don't know they're there other than the mirror reflection, how do you explain if not self-awareness? And we didn't have a good answer for him. We failed in the eyes of our supervisor, and we were shocked ourselves to say, wow, this is a pretty interesting way to study self-awareness. Um, maybe this dude is on to something. Uh, again, it messed my head up. Um, a, when I learned that dogs don't pass, dogs aren't self-aware. I was like, oh, no. Um, that doesn't mean dogs aren't self-aware, by the way. F not passing doesn't mean a lack of self-awareness. But when you pass, it's seen, and, and we call it passing when you touch the dots more. You know, that seems to imply that you know you're, you're self-aware. Um, chimps passed. Not, ch oh, Povinelli's, don't I have, okay, so, so I'm going to come back to Povinelli in a second. I just want to make this, this uh, point. I should have flipped those slides, sorry. Um, variants of this mirror test have now been applied to a bunch of animals, uh, and you have to change the test a little bit because, well, for example, when it's done on dolphins, dolphins don't have hands, they can't touch stuff, but you can put a mark on their side that they have to really flex to see, and, and you show that they will. They're interested in that as well. So dolphins pass, killer whales pass. Most of the great apes pass. Interestingly, gorillas do not. It's kind of fun. And so what do you make of that? What does it mean when an animal does not pass? It's funny. There's two current theories about the gorillas that I know about. One theory says, of all the animals, gorillas live in places where the water contains crocodiles. And there aren't many animals that can take down a gorilla, but a crocodile can. Um, and if, if you get to, as a gorilla, if you get too enamored with your reflection in the flat water, you're looking at that flat water and going, oh, that's cool, um, you could get ate by a crocodile. You're in the perfect position, you know, staring at saying, eat me, so to speak. Uh, and so the claim is that gorillas have learned not to look at reflections. That's one of the idea. And so they don't really pay attention to the mirror very much. Maybe. There's another theory. Another theory is, Gorillas just don't care <laughs> that the gorilla looks at the mirror and goes, hey, there's stuff on my face. Big deal. <laughs> Who cares? I'm not going to bother to explore it. I couldn't care less. So the idea is gorillas are generally a little bit more lazy on the animal kingdom front um, and, and maybe less neurotic. They don't worry about stuff. Who knows? Um, let, let's go back to dogs and, and just mention dogs for a second and, and make a point that I, that I made earlier. Dogs are not visual-focused animals. They are uh, smell-focused animals. That's their dominant sense. Uh, and so maybe testing a dog to, you know, does it recognize its own reflection and think that something's on its face? We're talking about a visual reflection there. And maybe that's just not a big deal to dogs. What if you could take their own scent, what they smell like, and put that somewhere where it shouldn't be, where they haven't been. Would they react to that smell? Like, how did my smell get over here? You know, my smell get over here. So there are variants you could do for every animal that respects their own sort of sensory thing. And, and just because an animal doesn't pass the test, that doesn't mean they lack self-awareness. But so many animals do. I mentioned here ants, elephants, Octopus, 
there's a lot of animals, cuttlefish, there's a lot of animals that pass the mirror test. And so if self-awareness is this important thing and we think, well, if, if an animal is self-aware, then it deserves proper ethical treatment. Well, we have to, <laughs> we have to bring a lot of animals into the, into the human side of our research ethics thing because it looks like a lot of animals. At, at the very least, it does not look like it's in something where we can say humans don't have this, or sorry, humans are self-aware, animals are not. That's not what the data suggests, the data that we have. Uh, by the way, human children, as I mentioned here, often do not pass the mirror test until they're about one and a half to two years old. We think certain brain areas have to develop before a child can recognize the reflection as their own. If you go online, look for rouge test in children, you will find that young children do things like look behind the mirror for that other little kid they see, just like the animals in stage one, right? They think that reflection is another kid and they're trying to figure out where they are and how they can play with them. And it's not till about a year or half or two where they start to realize that's me in that, in that thing, okay? So brings up a ton of questions. Does this mean that a whole bunch of animals are self-aware just like us? Um, and does it also mean that self-awareness takes time to develop even in us humans? If you, take, if you just accept Gordon Gallup's research and his conclusions, then that's where you'll be. But now I also want to use this as an opportunity to again show you how science um, works, okay? And what, what, how important critics are. So every time somebody says, here's a set of data and here's what I think it means, other scientists immediately go, yeah, I don't know. Let me make sure there's something else he hasn't thought of. And one of those scientists is Daniel Povinelli. Um, Povinelli was, you know, really the only person to kind of take Gordon Gallup on, but he offered an alternate explanation for the findings. What he suggested, and this was mostly in the chimp days, it would be interesting to see how well you could extend the Povinelli's uh, explanation to other animals, but he was still, this was still when the chimps were the ones that had passed, and we hadn't kind of explored it as widely. And what Povinelli said is, chimps live in trees, and they have to have very good what he called motor kinesthetic awareness. They have to know where their bodies are. You know, it's that stuff we talked about with the parietal lobe, really. Knowing where your body is, knowing where things are out in the world, because they do things like swing on vines and jump over to trees and all this stuff, dangerous stuff. If they got it wrong, they could fall to their death. Um, but they're very comfortable doing it. They have a very strong awareness of their bodies and, and how to use them in a complex world. Let's, let, let's call it that way. So that's one of the things Povinelli said. Let's, let's just take that as true because that's true. Um, then he also kind of said, okay, where I want to go, I want you to think of this analogy. You know, when you play a video game, especially a, a role-playing kind of video game where there's a character that's you, and you can control that character. You can move that character through the world with various controls. Um, you can have that character do certain actions um, and, and try to reach certain goals. Uh, and so you're in complete control of that character. But... It's not you. you. You don't, I mean, it's your character in the game, but you're never really thinking that's me. You're thinking that's this thing I can control. Okay, so what Povinelli said is maybe this is what's happening with the chimps. They've been anesthetized. They've been marked. We now re-show them the mirror. They look in the mirror and they see the red marks. Maybe they're not thinking there's red marks on my face. Maybe they're thinking... That critter there has red marks on its face, that reflection thing. And they've come to know that reflection thing. They've come to realize that they can control it. This is where the motor, uh, kinesthetic motor uh, awareness comes in. The idea is that the chimps learn very early on they can control that thing. So we think of it as a reflection, right? We think that thing does whatever we do. It's just reflecting us. But Povinelli is saying maybe that's not their conception. Maybe they're seeing it more like a video game character and they're learning I through motions I make, that thing makes certain motions. Um, and so now my character over there has stuff on his face. I shouldn't have said my character because my character implies self-awareness. That character over there has something on its face. Um, it should try to check it out. 
I can help it. I can control that. I can make it touch its face and look at it. I can make it touch its earlobe and look at it and smell it. And this is what the chimps were doing, by the way. They were going, this, they always bring things to their nose to smell them and check them out. Um, but maybe it wasn't, it's on my face. Maybe it was, it's on that character's face and let me help that character explore that thing. Okay, you might go, I don't know, that seems like a stretch. Um, maybe it is a stretch, uh, but this is how science works, okay? As soon as somebody go, goes out there like, like a Gordon Gallup and says, look at this experiment, it shows self-awareness, we want other scientists to be very skeptical and say, hmm, I don't know, is there any other possible theory? And then they come up with another possible theory, and that's what I just gave you, right, was that other possible theory, then what do you do? I don't think Povinelli was ever able to do the next step. The next step would be to come up with some experiment where if his theory was right, the animal should respond differently than if Gallup was right. You like to come up with an experiment that can discriminate between the two possible theories, where only one theory can make the right prediction. And when you do that, you know, then the theory that makes the right prediction, that other theory is in trouble. Um, and so, again, you know, you do the research, you come up with a, a theory or a claim that you want to make. Other people come up with counter theories of that. And then you put those theories against each other. Uh, and that's how you continue to develop your knowledge and your understanding. Again, I don't think Povinelli was able to really come up with a, a real good experiment. And I think what also kind of hurt Povinelli's perspective was when all these other animals that don't swing in trees, um, showed the same sort of pattern, you know, a, a wide variety of animals showing that same sort of pattern, where I think even Povinelli has come to the position now of saying, yeah, that probably reflects some level of self-awareness. Cool. All right. Is that my last slide? I think it's my last slide. No, it's not. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. I had, I had this slide. Is that my last slide? Yeah, that's my last slide. Okay, so let me just zoom back out here. Cool. Excellent. Self-awareness. Um, you now have a clear sense of how you can experimentally try to get at something like self-awareness. Um, you also, I hope, have a little bit more food for thought in terms of how are humans different than animals and why do we deserve better ethical treatment? I threw out very early on that you know science should only have a double standard. They should only treat animals different from humans if there's some really good data to support them doing so. Here's an attempt to find some data to show that humans are self-aware and animals aren't. But that's not what the data shows. The data seems to suggest that a lot of animals are self-aware to various extents. Maybe it's a continuum of self-awareness that we're all on. And this is the part, you know, that starts to make me think, okay, well, then I'm not comfortable pretending that we are special in some way, um, special in some way that deserves better ethical treatment. So I like you guys all to think about that too, of course, um, as we go through. Um, but but this but this was a big sort of deal for my thought in that respect. Okay, that's it. That's the end of my favorite self awareness chapter. Um, very cool. If you want to learn more, just again go to Google Scholar, do mirror test or rouge test. You could find some of the more recent stuff. Um, and yeah, geek out on it. Alrighty, talk to you later, guys. Bye bye.